Sanchez. Our first speaker today is Mary Sterling Anderton, and Mary Sterling will be introduced by her father, Philip Anderton. Thank you, Brooks. <laughs> Good morning. As Brooks said, I'm Mary Sterling's dad. And I have to admit, I'm a little surprised to be here. We were discussing the possibilities to introduce Mary Sterling over a family dinner, and it seemed to be the only requirement was no crying. Well, I'm the biggest crier in the family. Um, so, like I said, I'm a little surprised to be here. Plus, I don't sugarcoat, no fluff, right, Walker? Maybe it was just a simple process of elimination. Jack, freshman, too much of a wild card. Miss Anderton, director of admissions, too familiar. The dog can't talk. So here I am. <clears throat> Regardless of how I got here, I am honored to introduce Mary Sterling for her senior speech. While I do not know the details of the speech, I know a little bit about the speaker. Mary Sterling, what a name. Poor girl, started out tough, didn't have a name for almost a week, and then her mom, <clears throat> and then we gave her a double name to make it even more challenging. Luckily, Ms. Hendricks very early on showed mercy and allowed her to just write MS. But she didn't stop there, Mary Sterling. Summer of 2015 at Camp Greystone, she just dropped Mary altogether and went by Sterling. She went back to Mary Sterling after we corrected her and told you have a double name, we would like you to use it. But then it went to MS, and as far as I can tell, that is stuck. She is open-minded when it comes to her name choices. She's also industrious. At a young age, she veered away from the traditional lemonade stand and set up a stand at the end of the driveway to sell pillows. <laughs> Small throw pillows, accent pillows, they were like snowflakes. No two were alike, but she had a sewing machine and she was going to use it. What I love most about Mary Sterling is that she's fearless. She's not afraid to do her own thing, whether that's making visual art with different mediums, Camp Greystone, Adventure Treks, and now Moon Dance. And until she goes to college in August, well done, Mary Sterling. Her semester in Switzerland was the biggest test yet. Foreign country, knowing no one. Where during parents weekend, she and I spent three freezing hours inside a gorge hundreds of feet above certain death, standing on nothing but a two by four and those carabiners just fighting gravity. She was so calm the entire time. After we got out of the gorge, she told me that was her second time in the gorge and that it was okay if I was a little nervous. Like I said, she was fearless. And it is with great joyful pride that I turn it over to Mary Sterling. I hate running. You may wonder how I can hate running while playing multiple sports that involve a lot of running. Well, I'm asthmatic. I run into several challenges with being asthmatic. However, the main reason is that it makes it hard to breathe while I run and do other physical activities, which makes me very uncomfortable. And I hate being uncomfortable. Despite hating running and being uncomfortable, the feeling of being done with an action or task that puts me in a state of discomfort is amazing. Running is just one example of something I can avoid to stay in my comfort zone. People advise leaving your comfort zone occasionally, but I enjoy living in my little comfort zone bubble. I've played sports my whole life, so I spend much of my time being uncomfortable. This summer, on July 15th, preseason started. 
Anyone who is there knows it is a test to push yourself out of your physical comfort zone to see what you can really do. We run to figure out how in shape you are and find your physical limits. This is the low light of the season for me because I hate running, but sadly, it is a requirement to be on the team. The first day, I remember picking up the girls I drove at 6.45. In our minds, it was way too early to be awake. We drove to Champions Trace to see what we would endure that day. We were all talking about how we hoped we wouldn't have to run the mile the whole way there, but we were wrong. Once we got there, we got our shin guards on and started stretching. When we were done, the dreaded phrase was announced. Get on the line, we're going to run the mile. There was a collective sigh from the team. No one wanted to run. I hated running and being uncomfortable so much that I hadn't run all summer. So I wasn't exactly prepared for the mile. We all got behind the starting point and the whistle was blown. Immediately, I tried to find someone to pace myself with. It was difficult because I felt like everybody was running faster than me. After one lap, the asthma kicked in and my throat became dry. I started to slow down step by step. I realized maybe I should have run over the summer. I pushed through the discomfort and finally crossed the finish line. However difficult the actual act of running was, I had done it. I overcame the discomfort and finished the mile. I felt amazing once I was done, besides the usual shortness of breath and my legs feeling like jello. I was glad I had pushed through and finished with a much better time than I had anticipated. The act of running that mile was difficult and borderline terrible, but the sense of accomplishment I felt afterward was immeasurable, and it made running worth it. I realized that running was still awful, and I wanted to avoid it if I could, but the sense of accomplishment encouraged me to continue pushing myself. Running isn't the only thing that makes me uncomfortable. Public speaking is one of my biggest fears. It's the fact that everyone in the room is staring at me and I'm not a fan. Public speaking is always something I try to avoid. I even procrastinated writing the speech because the idea of public speaking makes me want to pass out. But here I am doing yet another thing that makes me uncomfortable. In class, if I'm doing a group project, I make more of an effort to work on other parts of the project so I don't have to get in front of everyone and talk about it. One of my monumental public speaking moments was in middle school. When I was in eighth grade, the pandemic sent us home for an extended break, which ended up lasting months. I know I should have been more upset and worried about the huge virus attacking the world, but I was concerned about my me project. I was not excited to say the least. And when I heard that we would have to go home and I would sadly have to do my me project digitally, I was over the moon. I was so excited that all I had to do was submit a video of me reading my speech while going through my slides, knowing that maybe five people would see it. Although some people still had to see me read it, it was not the amount I initially tried to prepare myself for. Eighth grade me probably would have died. At that moment, I thought this was the best outcome, but looking back on my me speech now, I think that it would have been helpful if I could have faced my fear, gotten up in front of everyone, and given my speech. If I could, I would go back now and give the speech. Facing my fear and being uncomfortable in that moment would benefit me so much now. Uncomfortable situation, and trying to live outside my comfort zone. Everything always felt like it was in such a distant future. I remember sitting in our advisories, watching the senior speeches, thinking I had so much time until then. High school has flown by. This year in particular has gone by faster than all the rest. I've been trying to savor every moment because I know that I won't have this amazing community around me next year. I want to leave this school knowing I did the best I could to create memories that I will look back on fondly. To savor all these moments I will have here, I want to push myself into situations that might, me, might make me a bit more uncomfortable because I know that because of that, I'll become a better person. Going to college will be challenging and those uncomfortable situations I've been in can help me overcome these inevitable concerns. However, after going through the senior speech process, I'm confident in my ability to get out of my comfort zone. Thank you. Our second speaker today is Max Ledoux, and Max will be introduced by Mr. Hinton. Now it's my turn to do something uncomfortable. Good morning. I have the honor of introducing Maximilian Ledoux today for his senior speech. I've known Max since he was in fourth grade, and from the first time I met him, I always suspected that he was really an adult in a small body. I met Max at the front desk when his mother was filling in at the desk and he was waiting for her for school to end. I watched Max answer questions, I saw him give directions, and I saw him actually doing work that you would do working at the desk. 
every time I left, after seeing him there, I would think, how old is this kid? He certainly didn't act like your normal lower school student. So as Max progressed through middle and upper school, he had some pretty amazing accomplishments. He won a Breeders' Cup photography contest, and he's done freelance photography. He planned fundraisers not once but twice, once to benefit the Kentucky Refuge Ministries, and most recently this past fall, for the Barker Brown Athletic Complex. He also works as a website designer and developer for Bourbon Experiences. Talk about adulting. Who wouldn't want all this on their resume? I know I would. So finally, earlier this year, Max came to my office and I asked him how his college search was going. Not only did he tell me where he was planning on going to college, what his major was going to be, but he also told me what job he thought he was going to have and when he was going to retire. <laughs> I'm getting close to retiring myself, and I don't even know half of that stuff. So, so you cannot tell me that Max has not always been an adult. But regardless of that, Max is always confident, he's always in control, he's never too high, he's never too low. Max is definitely a one of a kind. So without further ado, <laughs> my friend Max Ledoux. For 16 years, I've thought as home as the house I lived in. And while that is true, moving out of my childhood home one summer made me realize that home is a much more complicated thing. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be one place, rather it can be a collection of places. During that summer's beautiful sunsets, sunscreen scented air, and gentle breezes, I realized home can be thought of as being a moth and how they have to find a new light to call home each night. This realization surfaced during the beginning of a year-long process of building a new house, the process of creating a new home. During construction, I was able to watch each scoop of dirt moved, each yard of concrete poured, each two by six nailed, each piece of drywall screwed, and each appliance and fixture installed to eventually fit together into my new home. But during this process, I discovered many alternate places that I would also consider home. And now, instead of thinking of it as one definitive place, I like to think of it as each season of the year. No matter what season it is, and, regarding, and regardless of whether we like it or not, we live through it, making the most of our time and creating memories that feel like home. Once I realized that idea, I then began to notice that I'm surrounded by many different homes held on within the activities throughout my life. To be honest, joining the cross country team was purely an accident. From the ripe age of eight years old, I decided I would never run cross country. In fact, I decided I would never run at all. After trying it out as a third grader, I assured myself I would never wish something as horrid as cross country on anyone, let alone myself. An experience of weed surrounded courses, the feeling that you're definitely not going to make it to tomorrow, runner's knee, runner's stomach, and imminent vomiting. Yet young me was so wrong. What a surprise that is. My accidental liking of running began as an effort of off-season training for lacrosse. But as I began to run on the team, my involvement morphed into deeper and deeper involvement. It's almost like once you join, you can't get out. I began the season already behind everyone else with something to, close to a 10 minute mile and less experience with the team and rituals that come with it. But as the season went on and I warmed up to the idea that sure, maybe I joined one of the most mentally and physically challenging sports ever, I was able to look past the fact that, I was able to look past that fact because of the people surrounding the sport. The team was one that I chose to come, keep coming back to and keep being a part of. It was comprised of some of the only people with the ability to convince someone who is very determined of never coming back to indeed keep showing up and continue running miles and upon miles with them. My experience on the cross country team would not have been the same without the people. They convinced me that, all the, that it's all the small moments, memories, and interactions that create a new environment that can be called home. 
But as the leaves began falling and a fresh, cool breeze blew over, the cross-country season began coming to a close. It was then easy to think that that home would disappear with the arrival of shorter days, darkness at 6 p.m., and freezing winter temperatures. However, that was not at all true. The arrival of winter meant that sure, one of the busiest and worst parts of the year was upon us, with hints of seasonal depression. But I was able to take what I learned from the cross-country season and apply it to the winter. Winter marked the beginning of an even stronger drive to play the violin and expand my musical knowledge by beginning to arrange music. I began orchestration with the Disney, Disney moving theme and then went further to arrange Eleanor Rigby. And, there, and during this time, I was able to form an even greater bond with our strings class creating memories that last a lifetime and having many jokes throughout the whole class, making the strings environment feel like another home. Throughout the process of realizing home can be more than just one place, I noticed the extent to which I consider collegiate to be my home. And I'm now able to comprehend how important it is to me and the extent to which it has affected me. My journey here began when I shadowed on November 4th, 2014, during the same year that I refused to join the cross country team in third grade. During, that, during the year I refused, uh, I mean, my shadow day began in Mr. Schindler's class and I vividly remember the people that made up that class. Senor Hernandez and his rolling cart of stuff, Miss <laughs> Smith, the lunch offerings, which at the time I thought consisted of a, a very fancy jelly for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, even though there were many fancier options. And the one memory that stands out the most was the fact that I was shadowing Charlie, but Cooper also thought I was shadowing him. <laughs> About 522 weeks, 3,650 days, 87,600 hours, or in simpler terms, a decade later, I know how important that first day in Mr. Schindler's class was and how it helped shape me into the person I am today. That day marked the beginning of a journey that built the biggest home and community I have outside of my immediate home. And just like the last pieces of trim being put in place, the driveway being formed and the keys being cut, I encourage you to look around and attempt to realize the many different places you can consider home. Thank you. Our third speaker today is Sophie Sergio, and Sophie will be introduced by her father, Chris Sergio. Good morning. Good morning. It's a great honor to introduce Sophie today, but it's an even greater honor to be Sophie's dad. I've been called a lot of things over the years, but I can honestly say that being called Sophie's dad is one of the ones that I'm most proud of and the ones that I most love. When Sophie asked me to introduce her today, I immediately asked, Soph, what am I allowed to talk about? Right? She smiled. She said, well, it shouldn't be too emotional. Don't embarrass me. And probably you shouldn't talk about any of the recent stuff. Nothing about high school. Easy, right? Right? So after much thought, I decided that I would talk about what her mother, <coughs> Wendy, and I love about her most. Her amazing positive mindset and outlook. A special balance of being both fiercely determined and wonderfully playful. And playful and creative, she knows what she wants when she's being fierce and playful and creative in that she makes everything better just by being around her. And strangely enough, if you know Sophie well enough, most of these events happen around food and primarily ice cream. So for example, when Sophie learned how to ride her bike for the first time, we were on a family vacation. Sophie was only four. To get you in the right mindset, four-year-old Sophie, you can remember this, right? Right, Soph? She asked, could we go get some ice cream? And we said, sure, if you'd ride your bike to the ice cream shop. She'd been practicing all week, but now she had a purpose. It was over a mile away and Sophie was determined. She hopped on her tiny two-wheeler, secured her helmet, and off she went, pedaling furiously. You can see that in your mind. Not pausing for stop signs, not pausing for crosswalks or even cars, 
powering up small hills and defying headwinds and picking up speed as we closed in in our uh, destination, Sophie made the entire way, never stopping. And when we arrived, she galloped right to the counter to place her order, and of course it was mint chocolate chip. A massive smile erupted on when the cone was placed in her hand, and that's when Wendy and I knew Sophie was fiercely determined, and we loved every aspect of it. The next story took place during the early days of COVID. To pass the time, Sophie created what she called our Saturday evening COVID family cinema. Each week, she worked on developing a new movie night theme. On Saturday mornings, creative clues were deployed throughout the house, handmade invitations were delivered, and the first family member to guess the movie earned freshly baked cookies. Not bad. Everyone was encouraged to dress according to the movie theme and compete for more prizes and snacks. But week after week, Sophie's creativity and thoughtfulness captivated our family, making those some of the best moments we've ever spent together. In our family, we always say E plus R equals O. Events plus response equals the outcome. In other words, you can't always control the events that happen to you. However, you can control how you respond to these events and make the outcome even better, hopefully. Sophie, your mom and I are so proud of you and of the choices that you're making. We believe in you and we can't wait to see how your future unfolds. We love you to the moon and back and back again and we'll be there every step of the way to support you. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Sophie Searchio, a fiercely determined, wonderfully playful ice cream fanatic who always finds a creative way to make everything better. Receiving an assignment that has no guidelines besides a time limit may sound like a dream for some people. But for someone like me, a self-proclaimed indecisive individual, it was anything but a dream. I work well with guidelines and a structure, so when thinking about what to write my speech on, I was a little all over the place. My thoughts wandered from topics such as family or countless memories of my time spent at collegiate, but nothing really came to mind. So I changed my method of thinking. I started to think backwards. What do I not want to write my speech about? This sparked many ideas, such as my sports career, because dislocating both knees and ending up as four-string bench warmer last season in field hockey would really not make an inspiring speech. And that I definitely should not talk about the time I accidentally ended up in Mr. Sutherland's office having an awkward conversation about how I made my entire viral class have to evacuate the classroom. Let's just say I learned quickly that pepper spray does not only affect your eyes, but also your lungs. Who knew? Still, I struggled with writer's block. However, when thinking about what would be a beneficial lesson that I could provide in five minutes, I thought about my backwards brainstorming, and how this might not be the most obvious method of thinking, but one that I find very helpful. Growing up, we are so accustomed to getting asked about things we want or like. For example, what's your favorite movie? What do you like to do for fun? What do you want to be when you grow up? We're taught to only think about the optimistic viewpoints and not so much the dislike side. But in my experience, the negative side is easier to point out. I can tell you in an instant what my least favorite movie is, The Conjuring, or that I really don't like going to museums for fun, and that I know for sure I don't want to be any sort of doctor when I grow up because of my fear of blood. I find that people have stronger opinions or viewpoints on things they don't like or want to avoid because they tend to be more memorable, as well as there are fewer of them. And when contemplating activities or viewpoints we like and enjoy, the question tends to become overwhelming because so many my ideas come to mind. In no way am I applying that I think negatively in situations. Rather, I found it beneficial to eliminate anything I'm certain I don't want or like before thinking about the full picture. I found this method of thinking to not only be impactful in brainstorming for papers, but very helpful in real life situations. This process became an important factor in solving my indecisiveness a few summers ago. My parents had been nagging me all spring, asking me what I wanted to do that summer, and I didn't really know, and therefore made no effort of figuring something out. So what did my parents do? Well, they sat me down one evening, and as we were discussing summer plans, just dropped the bomb that I would be going on a two-week backpacking trip. Now, at first I thought they were joking because they know how much I love the comfort of my bed as well as air conditioning, and that the idea of camping for one night was one thing, but for two weeks is an entirely different story. 
But turns out they weren't joking, and sooner than later, I found myself stuck in the middle of woods in Maine, sitting in a soaked three-person tent for four, with four random strangers. I spent those 14 days living off of chicken broth, Pedialyte, and peanut butter jelly sandwiches. One night after finding out we miscalculated the amount of food we had, I found myself eating dinner that solely consisted of peanut butter. To say this wasn't my ideal way to spend my summer would be an understatement. However, despite these challenges, this experience taught me a valuable lesson. I learned that merely expressing my preferences or concerns would not only have helped me have a more enjoyable experience, but also not put my parents through all the trouble of guessing what I may or may not enjoy. Simply expressing what I didn't want to do and didn't enjoy could have been an easier step. Instead, I froze when faced with the overwhelming possibilities. So you think I wouldn't make that mistake again, for as they say, we should learn from our decisions, right? Or learn from our lessons, sorry. Yet somehow, in the start of freshman year, I found myself in a similar situation. Collegiate is truly an amazing school that provides its students with so many different opportunities to try new things and get involved. However, all these choices backfired on me because again, I found myself freezing up due to indecisiveness and what I wanted to partake in. But thanks to my ever so involved parents, they volunteered forced me to join the school leadership for there's one spot open, honor board. Luckily, there was no speech to be made because no one else was running for it, but there were also no details on what I would be doing. So, the first time walking into the room with six upperclassmen, Miss Daly, and Miss Brundage was a little nerve-wracking to say the least. And in my head, I was telling myself, I don't want to do this. Luckily, this incident of indecision, unlike my camping experience, had a positive outcome. And I'm grateful for my parents' influence and honestly, the lack of detail, for I don't know if I would have signed up for it. Although I find myself sometimes crying after the cases and randomly getting a weird sense of low blood sugar, Honor Board has given me an opportunity to explore a unique aspect that Collegia has to offer. It's taught me the importance of empathy, as well as showing me that I don't want to be a lawyer or a judge or rather any position placed with that much power over someone's life, and for that I am grateful. Identifying the don'ts in my life provides me with time to explore the do's. By consciously figuring out what I want to avoid, I'm able to carve out time, enabling me to explore and discover new passions while still maintaining a balance. Recognizing my limits isn't a constraint, but a foundation that leads to growth. It allows me to push myself at a rate that I'm comfortable with. Um, as I embark, like many others, onto a new chapter of life, acknowledging the fact that there will be new experiences and opportunities to explore is important. However, so is acknowledging your limits and what you don't want to do or feel comfortable with. Now, I know I've spent my entire speech focusing on the importance of recognizing the don'ts in your life. However, there are a few things that I do know for certain. I do know that I will greatly miss the school. Being surrounded by amazing people for these past 13 years, I have formed my second family. I do know that I will miss seeing my parents every day as well as their constant dedication to pushing me out of my comfort zone, although I'm sure they'll find a way to do the same thing in college. However, despite all of this, I do know that I'm very excited for what is to come.